When I posted a teaser for this video, views and subscriber numbers pretty much blew up to the standards of this channel, that is, a small step for mankind. But it was clear that you all wanted to know about Hollywood script readers. And in today's video, Michael Sweeney talks more about his time working for the likes of Netflix and Taylor Sheridan's 101 Studios. He talks about the different deal for Netflix readers versus those at other companies, what the reports they use look like, whether the writers get to see those themselves, and what is so good about reading lots of bad scripts. Michael is a union story analyst, and my first question was, what does that mean? Since we're technically editing and, and suggesting edits for stories, the, the there were so many script readers that were working for Hollywood that they had all banded together and eventually convinced the Guild to create a, a, a specifically union-protected category for script readers in which they're called story analysts so that for a very niche part of the industry that's often forgotten about, um, it's a nice way for them to know that their their jobs, their work, and everything is is protected by people um, like them, their own representatives. How exactly does it work, um, and and how do the scripts land with a producer? Is th is that different for each company? Do you work with companies that are open to any submissions? Are there that only accept uh, submissions from agents uh, or solicitors? How, how does it work? Unfortunately, a lot. Of, well, most companies have a um, you know, no soliciting policy. But what I have found is that and this is another lesson in terms of if you end up being a script reader. If you read a script that's really good, when you're done with work for the day, go on LinkedIn and look up the writer. Maybe Google the uh, Google the writer. Like, see see if they have projects that they've worked on before. See if they know somebody you know. Because I found that while a lot of people and a lot of scripts are sent from agents and managers. There are scripts that I have read that I, I I go on someone's LinkedIn and I go, oh, this person knows my colleague. And that's the only reason that they, that I just read their script. They have no agent. They have no manager. Some of them weren't even writers. Like I looked at their their LinkedIn and, and it's a completely different field. So hearkening back to it's about who you know, you know what the company does, you know their kind of genre, brand, niche, and you have a script that's just like it use that connection because you never know it may land in front of someone like me who's been reading a bunch of scripts all day from from you know represented writers who whose scripts may be a little bit lazy and you may have something that's like a hidden gem and just by virtue of the fact that you know someone you never know if you'll get it past the uh the readers the assistants or the the gatekeepers so to speak of the of the companies working through a, an amount of scripts. How many scripts were there? How much time did you have to read them? And how would you report your feedback back? Would there be um, just written notes or would there be a discussion? And that's a lot of questions, but go for it. It varies. Uh, so when I was working with Netflix, they paid by the hour and not by the script. That was Netflix sort of telling us you don't have to worry about getting through this as fast as possible because you want to be paid more for more scripts. We want you to be as detailed as possible. And with Netflix, you would get scripts from different assistants who were assigned to different producers. So knowing what that producer's niche was is very important. If there is a, a, a romantic drama that's very dense and very, and it is submitted to somebody who is quick action, plug a, a big movie star in here and make this kind of B-level action flick, you are not going to want to recommend it to them. But when it comes to other production companies that I freelance for, um, they pay per script. So there's more of a incentive on my end to kind of get them out as quickly as possible, as concisely as possible, but as quickly as possible. And they, they can usually range from, you know, eight, to 12 on a good month uh, scripts a month, uh, there will be a dialogue coming from the individual who emails the script saying, hey, this script is of particular interest. Maybe tailor your comments as to how you can fix the script as opposed to being either accepting or dismissive of the scripts. Because there are some scripts that come in and it's like, tell us what you think. 
Should we make it? Should we not make it? But there's some scripts that might be a work in progress and they say, we like it. We know it's not great. So even if you are harsh with it, give us ways to sort of build it. But that's at the production company's um, discretion most of the time. Our viewers may be familiar with coverage templates. Is, is that the thing? Is that the thing that you've always used? Or are there other ways? To do you just write reports or other meetings with you in, in certain cases? It's going to be a page of synopsis and a page of comments because they don't know the script. And if, if you're doing consulting work for somebody else, like the work that I do um, on my own, I typically don't include the synopsis because my client knows their story. It's it's better suited to have more pages devoted to the commentary. Um, but when it comes to yeah, when it comes to the overall format of the of the script, there are some some companies have grids where you have every category of premise, structure, character, story, and usually dialogue and. There's a grading system, whether it be excellent, good, fair, poor, or whether it be a number grading system. And that box also helps. Um, it helps contextualize why you are either passing or considering on a script. And if you're a client and you get those notes, which I include for clients, I just felt that it's it's important because it 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 gives you a range of where your script is at as opposed to a pass or consider, which is very much like one or the other, you know? So that's that's typically how um, how I like to, to keep things when it comes to the format. Those coverage uh, notes are really coveted by the writers themselves. Do they ever get to see this? I usually lean toward probably no. Um, at least I hope no, in some cases, because there are some cases where I'm a little bit blunt, where I would think, ah, I don't really want the writer to see this. Um, but I've also found that, uh, having friends that are writers, like they're not going to read the coverage report. It's going to be a matter of the agent is going to come back to them saying, Hey, we sent it to these companies for coverage. And here's what they all said. No, no, maybe yes, no, no. And like give a very brief reasoning as to why because it's all kind of like a, a game of it's a little bit of a game of deception you kind of have to have a little bit of a poker face like no one is gonna you know the assistants of the production companies when they talk to the assistants of the agents are going to say things like it wasn't the right fit for us it was a little too long it was a little too this it's going to be very vague so oftentimes writers don't really get to see that which is why i think that you know, uh, services like, you know, when, when you submit to contests and they have coverage feedback or what I'm trying to do in growing my business, it's so valuable to the writer to get that back. Because if you're sending it to someone professionally, it's very unlikely that they are going to let you in on the secret as to why this didn't work or what you could have done uh, to improve upon the script. Um, why do you like this job? Because I, I would expect that because there's only a tiny, tiny minority that gets a, a, a consider, let alone um, a recommend, they're mostly bad scripts. So why do you do this? I found that it's very constructive as a creative myself and as someone who writes scripts as well. It's always very valuable to see what you shouldn't do. So reading the bad scripts definitely helps um, me personally understand how can I avoid these pitfalls as well. Um, but also, like you said, it can be a little bit tiring and tedious, which is, which is again, what I sort of spun into this positive momentum of I want to create my own company that covers client scripts that if they so choose, we can hop on a video call and discuss it. But at the very least, I can give them question-based support in how to actually change their scripts. Because in any bad script is an idea that's like just struggling to get out. I've read so many scripts from my own personal clients where I go, ooh, I latched onto that. I really like that element. 
let's explore that more. Let me ask you what you meant by that. Like keeping them in the driver's seat, but also kind of like encouraging them to, to talk about it, to have a discussion, because that's my favorite part of the coverage. Even though it's very, you know, isolated and remote when I'm working for companies, when I get to the comment section, I am free flowing. I'm like, this is, I get to impart my perspective and that much of it, I, I consider a, I consider a privilege. So it can be tedious, but I try to count my blessings as, as best I can. Let's talk about craft. Um, sure. What would you say over the 10 years that you've been doing this? Is, has there been a, a change to, you know, to the better or the worse in terms of how well writers write? I mean, I'd like to be optimistic. So I'll say I think they've gotten more emotionally they've they've resonated with me more over over the years like i i found myself um i i'll never forget the first script that really moved me it's actually one that i i have on my website as having collaborated with it was called um i believe it was called come not come from away but come away and it was a it was a peter pan alice in wonderland mixture and a lot of it was about grief and about, it was it was very dark like it was a very dark story about a family overcoming grief and I kind of like had to blink away tears from it. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And as I've continued on as a reader, in fact, in the last like maybe two, three years, there's been scripts that I've read that I've been like, this genuinely moved me. And one like even made me had to like, you know, sh like wipe away a tear. So I think that it's incredibly powerful when that does happen. Um, unfortunately, I think there's always going to be a constant of you read more bad scripts than good. So I don't know how much I could vouch for really if writers have gotten better or worse, because to me, it just kind of always feels like the same ratio of good to bad. But I will say that there are times more so now, maybe I'm just getting more sensitive. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just mellowing a little bit, but I, I think that there is, there are a lot of scripts that are, are very moving that I've read in, in recent years, as opposed to when I first started. Mm -hmm. In terms of the specific craft aspects, what are the things that jump out where you, where you could say that if, if only writers would do this and it would be such an easy fix. If only writers would pace themselves better. That's always like one of the biggest things that I wind up seeing is that writers don't know how to pace, whether it be an over uh, over embellishing the action, whether it be a, a thing that I find so often is that there are times where uh, in, in scripts that have a high level of action and a high level of calm, there's all this character development clumped into the moments of calm because they don't know how to factor in character into action. The, the idea that a character's choices define them more than their words. So oftentimes, even if it's a high-speed car chase, whether a character decides to do A or B, that could say so much more than uh, what's known in a script as like a campfire sequence where like there's a moment of calm and they wax poetical about their childhood. It, it, it comes off as very you know, it's like they're, they're sort of droning on and on and on. So th there's times like that where I, I wish that they would um, fix the pacing and also like, also a character, you know, knowing your character so well, like it's the, there, there's always that, that, that picture of, um, you know, how the, the iceberg, there's more of the iceberg under the surface than there is atop the surface. And I'm sure anybody who studied screenwriting has probably seen this visual of when you develop your character, you yourself need to know the entire iceberg, even though what people are seeing is just the top of the iceberg. And um, a very brief and very specific example, it's going to seem very odd that I, I bring this up, but it happens so often that I feel that the, the viewers would uh, benefit from this, um, is if you have a group of characters, and usually I say like, you have a main character and then it's like, it's their three friends. If those three friends don't have varying perspectives and you could interchange the dialogue with any of them and it would not make a difference, make it one friend. Or better yet, cut them. Make sure that every single character you write, somebody would want to play. Even if it's a small role, even if it's a role that doesn't have a name, make sure that they are absolutely necessary. Like when you are writing 
And it's about, this could be apply to anything, but if you look at a character, a location, anything, and you think to yourself, what would I lose if this was cut? If you don't have an answer to that question, then you got a problem, you got to develop it more, or you got to cut it. You got to cut it loose. So that's, I think that at large is what I would probably um, suggest just from, just from some scripts that I've read this week, in fact. There's a little more to come where we talk about Taylor Sheridan's The Mayor of Kingstown, cultural awareness, and Michael's own script in development. So stay tuned. Now, if you're concerned about AI for screenwriters, so you should. I have an interview in the works with writer-producer Oren Schwed, who has his finger on the pulse of the use of AI in the film industry. In that video, you'll hear what the future may have in store for screenwriters, if there is one. Subscribe if you want to be notified when those videos are released, and if you want to improve your own screenwriting skills and at the same time support this channel, check out my.scriptwriting.courses. See you in the next video. Happy watching, happy writing. Cheers.